Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Lab. My name is Zan Zerbel, and for anyone who's new to the lab, this is where we have conversations with a wide range of adventurous individuals to educate, stoke, and inspire. In today's episode, Marshall Yanzik and I speak with Nate Menninger. We get to know Nate and how his life led him to creating the Porter film, his journey as a porter in Nepal, and the creation of the film itself. So with that, on to the show. Go ahead and kind of just tell us who you are and kind of how you came about to create this film. Yeah, sure. I'll give you the uh, the version I can, I guess. I don't know if I should should describe this photo, but uh, this is one of my later, later projects. I grew up in a small place, um, kind of a wealthy suburb outside of Boston. I like to say the not so wealthy town next to it because I feel like that makes me feel more sound more authentic but i grew up in a wealthy suburb i went to uh college at uva after transferring and uh played lacrosse there so i'm i'm not gonna say i'm an asshole i don't think so um but i come from that world uh and uh i walked on there so it's a bit different anyways i got very injured in college and sophomore year um I felt like I had to find solace elsewhere and I ran with the bulls in Spain. And that's when I fell in love with this idea of, you know, massively immersive, dangerous projects, adventures and and careers in a Red Bull-esque way with no training or with, you know, as little knowledge as I could entering it, just going as a clean slate. And so every summer I'd sneak off and after the bulls, it was scuba diving this, this place in Belize, which was like the deepest place and doing it illegally with, a certification we got in 36 hours and then the next summer was graduation instead of getting a job i uh i just took off you know i bought a ticket to argentina with a with a snowboard and a saxophone which is i guess a lot of people do things like that but it was kind of radical amongst my my group i was with probably not amongst you guys but uh, i just took off i had two thousand dollars saved and in six months i i pretty much just lived the life of extreme poverty if you've read Jack Kerouac. I haven't read much, but I think it's pretty similar to that lifestyle living under the stairs in a, in a Harry Potter like room with one wall. That's a glass sliding door and sleeping in vans with people I never met really. And a whole lot of poverty and eating white rice with salt. Uh, it was formative, I think to say the least, but I did manage to do a couple more projects and I kind of developed into the more cultural side. And when I got back, after some time, I just decided to dedicate my life. And that was the first time I went to Nepal. Uh, and, you know, I did a couple more. Pro- I taught myself Nepal. I wanted to go swear to silence and write about it. I was a writer. I don't want to get too into that. But I'd done these other projects. Um, uh, the particular one was I wanted to knock on a monastery in the mountains like they do in James Bond, you know, and, and swear to silence for three months because I thought that was a real thing. I thought I could write about it. So I taught myself Nepali. That's why I learned it um, with Google and some Cornell. Oh my God, that's crazy, Marshall. It was actually with some Cornell back pages, believe it or not. Uh, They have this Nepali back page. And that was one of the resources I used to teach myself. Uh, Go go Big Red, baby. Go Big Red. It's a really small world. Anyways, they used that. And then I went, by the time I left, I found out it wasn't really real. Um, what I was trying to do, there was an alternative. Anyways, I did this two weeks. I did high altitude ice climbing, which is right here. And then I pretty much hunkered down uh, to basically, you know, make this into a real career. I was getting so crazy that I felt um, <laughs> this needed, I needed to have proof. Like writing was going to take too long. No one would read my books because I don't really read. So even if my books were great, who would buy them? I need to make sure there's a reason to buy them. I need visual proof. I don't know what that's going to look like. I've never filmed really anything, but let's try it. Um, I tried a couple more things. Maybe becoming a stripper was in there. Uh, writing for the director of Black Mirror, a ton of dead ends, but eventually I launched what became this project. Um, and yeah, it was a wild ride from there. But if you've seen the film, if you go see it, if you manage to see it, if you don't want to see it, maybe we'll talk about what it did to me later. But uh, that's basically what I was doing, you know, trying to make that life of that 
extreme immersive dirty jobs meets Nellie Bly, if you've heard of her, who faked insanity to report on a same asylum or George Plimpton, if you want to Google these names, they're, they're interesting people. And that was what I was, what I thought my purpose was. So that's what brought me here. So really it kind of started with the running of the bulls and then you just kept immersing yourself in these extreme either extreme experiences or deep cultural experiences. And they kind of just led you on a path to Nepal. And it sounds like you had some sort of affinity with Nepal to keep going back, learn their language and everything. That's awesome. I, I, I understand you also know a few other languages, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, my mind, I don't know if it's necessary with languages, but I just, uh, I have a very one track mind. Maybe it's because, A, I'm either dumb and I realize I'm only going to be good if I do one thing. <laughs> um, or I don't know what it is, but I have managed to learn a couple languages. English, that took me a while. Uh, <laughs> supposedly, I didn't talk until I was three. <laughs> then um, I know Spanish. I lived in Spain a bit. Spanish, I'm very strong in. And when I was in South America, I got thrown out of into or out of favela in Brazil, which I deem one of my projects kind of. And I had to learn Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese very fast. Um, then Nepali. And uh, because, you know, those French I can get with, you know, and Arabic is the lowest of the low. But if I got a job in two weeks, like I feel like I could get the language enough to convince them I speak it. Yeah, so a bit, bit of a polyglot and kind of sounds like most of the time you were just learning as you went because you had to for one reason or another. Yeah, some, I always like a base helps. Um, a base always helps. I had a little base in Portuguese that helped and I've never just gotten to a country with no base and learned. Language. Yeah, that would be oh. that would be a cool challenge. <laughs> yeah, maybe that maybe that's your, your following project in a few years. <laughs> um so nate for the for this next segment i'm gonna have marshall throw up a few different pictures um kind of just to showcase some of the things you've done so i'm gonna have him toss them up and then kind of just ask you to explain what's going on with that picture uh you know give us some before and aftermath and just give us an idea of uh you know how this fits in your life yeah all right all right now you ready for this i'm nervous but i'm ready let's go baby let's go this will be fun man you're a uh, you're you're a man of uh, you can do a little bit of everything, so this will, it should be good for everybody tuning in and, and those that'll watch this afterwards. So, here's our first one. Story time. Ready, set, go. Oh, jeez. This was I was living in. Uh, just as to start it off, if you wait until the end, you'll see that I'm not so, so self-absorbed anymore. I mean, I still am, but um, I was more. That's the point of all this. Anyways, this was. Uh, I was living in Spain, in Barcelona, trying to do something else, which I believe there might be a photo of. And uh, I snuck out to play for the Israeli national team in Germany. Um, and then we went to Czech Republic to do this world famous lacrosse tournament, 30 years running. I didn't even know lacrosse existed outside the country for that long. I'd never played this sport, which is box lacrosse. And this was Israeli's, Israel's team. Um, and, uh, I, you know, at this point I was living out of a backpack cause I was supposed to be gone for two days and it turned into 10 or 11 or something. And, uh, here we are playing. We won the national, we won the championship and, uh, it was had beers right after it was very fun. So it's, it seems like lacrosse has kind of been a formative formulative kind of game in your life. That's kind of shaped who you are today. Like, how does that tell us a little bit more about that and like how this game has shaped you now? Yeah, I don't know. I actually been playing soccer a lot lately, which I think is super fun. Um, lacrosse, it was sports in general for me where like, that was all that mattered. I wanted to go to the NFL um, very badly. And I figured lacrosse, I was the best at, and it's not as bad on your body. So I'll do four years of that and then I'll go to the NFL and then I'll be healthier. And, and uh, it was just sports. I thought I was really gifted when I was young. And I didn't necessarily love them. I just thought, I don't, I don't know I, what I thought. I felt like I had to with, with it and um, with the ability I felt I had. But there were so many people better, faster. Um, yeah. But I, I thought I was that good, you know. And, uh, 
it, it's not necessarily cross. I think it's just it was the competitiveness. It, I don't know. I don't really know how it's formed me. How it's formed me? I mean, I can definitely bit. attest to the competitiveness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little discipline. How, how did you get on the Israeli national team, though? I uh, I went. There was a birthright. The Jewish people, the Jews, we get a free ride to Israel. You, everyone's heard of birthright. It's crazy. One year they started off a lacrosse version. I was still at UVA and I applied and they go and I, I, there was very few people who were D1 and I later played with them against Boston and University and Harvard and they happened to need someone some help. And so I was in Spain and I went over and then I did all right. And then they asked me to play in this team. And I don't know if it was their official team or just like kind of their official team. Uh, but yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that's an awesome experience in itself. Dude, getting to travel around the world and play a professional sport. Yeah. I, did, say I, I bought the a teams ticket. that you're playing for. I bought a ticket. I was, I had to buy a ticket, but they did pay for my housing there. Nice. Well, that's good. <laughs> So, so, um, so, so, uh, so I just want to circle back on sports for you. So you say soccer is now big for you. How's, how is that in your travels? Like, has that been a way that you've linked into to local co- cultures and, yeah, and different that's people? A good question. Soccer is fascinating because it's, it really is the game of the world. Uh, when I was at the favela right across where I lived was a cage, a cage with holes in it, a cage with drunk, sometimes beating on the walls. And inside was this dirt pitch, you know, 40 yards long. <laughs> And I would go in there. I'm not very good at soccer. I wasn't. Um, I played it when I was young. I'd go in there and play. And it was just fascinating. It was fascinating to get into the culture and how serious it is. And the experiences I've had playing, it was the first time I saw religion unite people there um, for real and uh, stop fighting and stuff. And hmm. then then playing it here, I was in the uh, – a different part of Atlanta near where the Wendy's burned down is where I was staying as of a week ago. And right next to it, there's a pitch, a soccer pitch, a pitch. Listen, look at me. And, uh, <laughs> I was, um, I play soccer and I was, I'm, I'm the only white guy. Uh, and it's most people are from Africa and I, I, it's a great opportunity to be with people that I'm not usually around to learn their perspectives, to learn more. I'm just, I'm addicted to like learning other people's perspectives, maybe because it's hard for me to get it off the bat. Yeah. So that's why I play soccer. Plus soccer, it's fun. And lacrosse is dead for me. You play, you play that way too long. And as, as it is for D1 athletes and beyond, you know, it can wear on you. Yeah, soccer is definitely a sport that you can pretty much play anywhere in the world. And there's always a, basically a ball around and people kicking a soccer ball around. So, yeah, great way to, you know, like, you're, like you said, immerse yourself into the culture and kind of see things from their perspective and get to understand them as, as a people. Yeah. Yeah. So, too. so lacrosse being your more formal athletic um, career. Now, Marshall's going to run us on to the next photo which is a photo of the running of the bulls mm. so tell us a little about a little bit about that kind of what got you started like what drew you to doing that and pull the trigger on it and then uh moving on to your dive that you were mentioning earlier yeah sure these are the two projects i did in college i can call them projects now but these were the two things i did and uh in spain i was living the host family um, doing that abroad thing. I had came from Israel. Um, running of the Bulls, if you don't know, uh, it was on TV there. It was, it had already started. And at the time I, I kind of knew what it was, but I wasn't sure. I remember seeing it when I was a kid on TV once or twice. Um, but I never really knew. And I still didn't know until I got there, but basically it's this place in Spain called Pamplona. A lot of people do it from all around the world. They let bulls run down, you know, I don't know how long, 0.3 kilometers maybe, um, through the streets. You stand in the streets and you run from them. And the closer you get, the more you touch them, the better your run was. So 
I went up there. I was just happening. I'm going up there. I went up there with a backpack. I had no place to stay. Uh, for two days, I just, you, you, it's a massive party there. So you stay up all night and at 6 a.m. I got in the, I had no place to stay. So I, I was going to sleep on the street. I just, I go straight to the running gate. You get there. I meet a local who's, who's been there six or seven times and he teaches me everything. I'm speaking Spanish and this is where it starts to develop what I do. And, and it's all about what I can do, what the pros do. He tells me what they do. Don't only the pros touch a bowl. So I'm like, wow, I'm touching a bowl. And he's like, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Like, don't do that. I was like, but they touch the bowl. He's like, yeah, yeah. But only the pros. I was like, um, so I try to touch a bowl and, and I did some other stuff. And the point was, is it was being led through the event with this local who'd done it seven times. who was teaching me how to do it in a real authentic way. And I became obsessed with that. So no one's really ever asked me and I've never had to explain it, but that, that's what I liked so much about it. It was not running with another foreigner. It was being led by this local who knew about it, who was, who was a ultra, I don't know, I think ultra Catholic and he was really sincere and, and uh, it was just this cultural exchange while we're doing something in extreme. Um, with yeah, I, that, that's awesome. That goes back to your kind of seeing something. You basically got to live it in his perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's awesome. He told me where to start, how to stand, and yeah, it was fun. So, yeah, was, so what, what, was, what was that experience, experience like? Was it, I mean, what's oh, it like running from bulls? <laughs> I mean – there are people who have done it and I'm, and you'll hear from them. People write books on it. I said, I tried to do it in this extreme way by touching a bowl during it. Uh, I, it's pretty screwed up. I mean, I'm not going to lie. You get in there and you're there by choice. So it's very, you know, survival esque. And uh, I was standing on the wall and the bulls were coming and I was sprinting that they said the bulls are really, really fast. So I sprinted and I turned back and the bulls were like nowhere near me. I was like, Oh, they aren't that fast. I slowed down. I hugged the wall. Bulls are coming. Bulls are coming. People are screaming everywhere, hugging the wall, jumping over the walls. I'm like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. It comes. I freaking lunge from the wall and I plant a firm hand on this matted fur of this dirty matted fur of a bull. And I'm like, hell yeah. Like, that's awesome. And I turn around and there's another bull behind me. And I'm like, oh, I'm a shit. So I weave around the bull and, and I'm running next to the bull. I'm freaking running and there's people cowering and, and huddling over themselves and screaming. And th they say you get really hurt and injured and, and you can die from getting trampled on. You know, it's, they say the locals sometimes are the one who cause pain because you don't want to touch a tail or break the local rules. And uh, anyways, I'm running next to this bull and I'm freaking, I see someone go down like 20 feet in front of me and I'm like, oh my God god and there's a pile forming now and i can't go in because there's a bull to my right and there's a, a woman to my left and there's this pile approaching and this is i'm a, i'm ashamed to say it but am i i had to survive and we were getting to that pile and i kind of had to do a little a little shoulder lift you know on the outside i think the girl might have went down i'm not sure and i jumped over um it was a very survival of your own when you're in there and you get in and there's a bunch of other stuff you lie down and the bull jumps over you. If you want, if you're dumb enough to do that, I did that. I didn't know what was really going on. And yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense, but it's all you're of your own doing, you know? Yeah. You choose it. And it's, and the bulls also, you find out all this stuff about the bulls afterwards, which is really screwed up stuff. So I don't know if I'd do it again. I didn't know about that stuff before. Yeah. And the other picture, should I say the other picture? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, tell, tell us kind of about this, this diving photo you have here. Yeah, this, this is my boy Hayden right here. Um, really nice guy. He's uh, got a solar panel company now. Anyways, I met him in Spain, and I, was, I, I convinced him to come with me to Belize to do a project to do this scuba diving. It wasn't necessarily like a project. It was just a trip to Belize, but I really wanted to do the scuba diving, and I – Bushwhack to get a cheap price. This place is called the Blue Hole in Belize. You can look it up. Uh, we had never been scuba diving apart from maybe that one time you go in a swimming pool. And the depth of the Blue Hole is 135 feet. 
uh, a normal PADI open water certification is to 65, I believe. You have, that usually takes four days to complete, um, sometimes longer, I think, if you're doing it over a long period of time. I think we took 36 hours. So we were skipping sh shit left and right. Um, you know, they were, he's like, you need to swim to shore and I can't really swim. So he throws us out of the boat on our way back from a long day. And I'm like, I'm like looking like I'm swimming, but I'm walking on the ground beneath. <laughs> it's, not, it's not very cool. And uh, anyways, we dive, we dive all the way down to 135 feet. And on the boat before, we're still like, like, do I got it? Like, oh, I think, I think I actually put my own equipment together for the first time. Like, that is dumb. That is very dumb. If you're diving beyond your limit, I mean, you can easily die down there. And uh, it was very dumb. Um, but yeah, it's a two hour boat ride into the middle of nowhere. It's a kind of vomity ride up and down and you get there and you dive in and there's sharks, there's tiger sharks. We touched a little baby nurse shark, but I call it a real shark on another dive. Um, and we came up and we were fine. And it's very, you know, after that, it's a very meditative thing to do. If you ever get the opportunity, it can be expensive, but it's, it's pretty chilling. You know, that's a good word, but it's pretty meditative and relaxes you if you can see some good flora and fauna for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so besides the, the sharks and stuff, what was the blue hole there like? Blue Hole is this cave in the middle of nowhere, um, and it's collapsed. It's a collapsed cave, so it's 450 feet down, I think, straight down, just in the middle of nowhere, and it's dark. If you go to the Blue Hole, it's terrible. You can't really see anything at all. Um, you see these silhouettes of sharks approaching, but otherwise, it's, it's pretty opaque light, especially the further you get down. You can see stalactites, but stalactites are about as cool as, you know, rock to me they weren't i don't know i'm not that i'm pretty basic the cool part is you go on these other little dives afterwards into the more coral reefs and that's when you're swimming through schools of fish with manta rays and seeing lobsters and diving world would be crazy one to get into cool if you're doing caves and stuff but uh yeah otherwise you know at the same time we were doing all these local things and adventures and that's what you really end up liking about it pairing it, the culture with the extremity and i don't think that's the right word but yeah well it definitely sounds like you uh took it to a little extra of an extreme level by uh <laughs> cutting some corners on your shirts and everything like that yeah it was, the red, bull. Fit it was that the red bull in. era you know <laughs> so that was an influence See, seems like a seems like a repeating theme here nate yeah i think i'm growing up <laughs> Hey, I got a question for you on this, this running the bulls one again, pardon, pardon. Again, I, I'm leaning on people like you who've experienced it firsthand. Why do, why do they wear all white and then, and then like red scarves and, and uh, oh. that's, that's a good question. They say <clears throat> that bulls are attacked, attracted to red, but that's not true. Um, at least to my knowledge, what I learned on the ground, which also could be false, but for the most part, and this is, what you've come to learn, which is kind of unfortunate, especially nowadays, the bulls are held in captivity and they're often confined. That's why they jump around like that. Uh, and they're also sometimes, they're in this really, 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 really dark room, which could be for a week or longer. You know, I don't even know the exact dates. And if it's not red, but it's any color. They're pretty much blinded when they get out. So like any bright color they're attracted to. So the white, you know, they don't see as well. And then the red they see, but you could be wearing green. You could be wearing pink. I'm sure the red probably, you know, its origin probably lies in some relative to blood. Um, in all honesty, uh, that, that it's it, running up the bulls is all about that hairy edge. It's can we not die doing this? Cause you're doing it at your own volition. So having the red on is like, is like that, you know that war paint of blood maybe i think but that second part is just postulation yeah are you still still in contact with uh with your local that that kind of showed you the ropes there no i have a picture i think and that's it i don't that's the worst part that's the worst mm -hmm. part i hope we'll cross paths again he was in barcelona but i don't know 
It's a great thing about adventures. You, you, you're inevitably, you will at some point. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 The world's pretty small. All um, right. We're gonna, let's move to the next one here. Uh, it's a, uh, bring it up there, Marshall. A little mountain selfie here. Tell, yeah. tell us about where this is, what's going on, what you're doing up there. This is uh, this is very story time. I feel like, ooh. Oh, I hope my stories aren't boring. I'm gonna try and get into it more. Okay, so <laughs> here, um, this is in the background is Aconcagua, <clears throat> which you guys are all adventure mates, so you've heard of it. The tallest peak outside of the Himalaya. I went to Mendoza eventually after this, which is where Aconcagua is, to summit it. It was gonna be illegal, but that's the general area. Um, here we're at Portillo, which is a very famous ski resort in uh, the Andes in Patagonia. And this particular thing is called the Super C. If you Google it, it's known as one of the, you know, they always say the most famous backcountry run or the longest, or it has those type of accolades and GoPro did a feature on it. So it's respected, you know? And uh, I really wanted to go after I saw the video very badly. So I was like, this could be a project. I've never done, really done backcountry skiing like that. So let's, let's do it. You know, this guy who I met a couple nights in a bar, uh, offers me a spot in his van. Can you drive stick? I can, he can't. Perfect. I don't have to pay. Perfect. I don't really have much money. So I go, we get there. We're sleeping in the middle of nowhere. I don't really know this guy. We're in this van. It's freezing temperatures in Patagonia. And, uh, well, I try to summit. Uh, you had to go to the top lift. And uh, from there, it's like a three or four hour hike, which I don't like to talk about because I wish it was pure backcountry, but I still call it backcountry. Um, so I brought a beer up. I bribed the guy. I was like, I'm going. He gave me a ride. I fell off the lift. I hadn't snowboarded in like two years. So this was a very dumb thing of me to do. Um, and uh, I got halfway up, the ski patrol came down and was like, you shouldn't go. You know, like there's a, there's a storm coming in and I think they had caught in wind of me falling off of the T-bar that I was sucked. Um, so I turned around, but I did not give up. I spent the next, I met this guy in that van escapade in a restaurant who offered me a penthouse apartment for free. Um, I was going to hitchhike back to Argentina. I did not. I stayed in Chile in his penthouse and for the next two weeks tried to train, you know, go up to the mountains as much as I could. And one of those trips, I went with some Facebook guys, met off Facebook. And one of those guys, I kept pimping. I kept pimping about the super C, the super C. Don't you want to do the super C? I mean, you live here. you got to do the super C. And it's kind of infamous there. It's like, I'm sure in Oregon, there's like some crags or some wall. I can't believe I just said the word crag, but there's some walls or hikes that are like, oh, you got, you're going to do that, you know? Um, so I convinced him. And one morning we, uh, we had buy the ice axe. I already bought the ice axe the night before um, and the crampons the night before I first attempted. I never touched them before, but I had them the, the night before I first time. So I still had them. I, uh, we get there. Uh, we're going to do it the real way. So I don't buy a ticket. Uh, he, he doesn't buy a ticket. And we're going to hike from the parking lot six hour hike. We set out, I'm listening to music. He's not, I'm like, why are you not listening to music? He says, because I want to remember this every second. I was like, shit, that's, that's some deep stuff. You're right. So I take my headphones out. I'm like, all right, no music, terrible decision. It was terrible. It was a super hard hike. You know, you're hiking through a lot of snow and it gets very steep. That back ledge behind me to my left, you come up there. Um, and you keep going and going and you get to this traverse point, which I wish we had a photo to show you guys. This is like a, I mean, if you, if you fall, you're dead, you know, and you have to walk across this and there's no ropes. And my friend is a while behind me um, and he gets there eventually. And he just, I'm like, dude, I gotta go. And he's just like, all right, I'm, I'm going back, you know? And I say, if the ski patrol, you know, if I don't come back in two hours, tell the ski patrol. Um, I had no beacon. I had no, this is really dumb. You know, I had none of the backcountry stuff. 
that you need. No beacon, shuttle, probe, none of it. But I saw some people go up earlier and I figured, okay. So I crossed this traverse, which was the first step, very sketchy. You know, my snow pants, I already ripped them with my crampons and uh, I had to bend down. And this is like a six inch ledge and it cuts through the snow face. And like I said, if you fall, you're definitely dead. But halfway through, you're in it. And then you're just like, yeah, this is dope. And you go to the summit and you ski down and most skiers could probably do it. You know, it was just that it was that one traverse, which was like, Oh my God, this is the dumbest thing. This is now the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> so, so you call it, you call it the Red Bull era. So this is the Red Bull era of, of Nate. What, uh, just explain that to me. What does that, what does that mean? I don't know. I think this is when I started to realize, like, I'm getting out of control here. You know, I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to die eventually if I keep with skiing particularly, like if I keep going on this, I'm going to try to do like the peaks and the crazy stuff. And, and that would be a lot, you know, like, I don't know if I can handle that, that type of Red Bull. What's the biking one called for Red Bull? I don't know when they go on the knife edge. Yeah. That, that like rampage, I think it's called. Like, yeah. I don't know if I can handle that level. Um, so I don't know. It was just this, this fascination with adrenaline and I guess it's just who I am. Fear was non-existent at that time, eh? Oh, uh, it wasn't crippling fear. Um, I mean, I think we all have fear, you know, I like to say we all have fear. A stockbroker has fear, but he still bets millions of dollars. If I go and try to be a stockbroker and bet millions of dollars, I'm going to freaking start shaking and stuff. You know, I'll be like, or maybe I'll just do it stupidly and lose all my money. But, you know, we all have our own things we do and we have fears of those, but we still kind of do them. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. And if you don't, if you let the fear get you, then you might fall because you're not as focused and yeah. you still might fall, but you might fall if you let it get you more. Yeah. Yeah, or if you don't have fear, you might fall because you're taking it too lightly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but very true. There, there are things people have done, I'm sure people listening, that are more dangerous. But for me, it was, it was out there for sure. Oh, yeah, especially if it clearly was your first experience doing anything like that. You yeah, just bought how... crampons and an ice axe, <laughs> touched them to snow for the first time doing that. So... <laughs> Yeah, commend you, know, you for that. The ice axe is so, like self arrest, and I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. So switching gears from, um, you know, something that might bring you fear in an aspect of, you know, exposure to elements and stuff like that. Um, our next slide, kind of, kind of oh, plays this, on a different, <laughs> a different note. Yeah, so yeah. tell us about this. Yeah, this is embarrassing to look at in front of other people um hey you provided these you provided these and said they were they were allowed to be published so this is on you live. you gotta be lively <laughs> yeah, i gotta be lively my what's crazier is my parents helped me set up the backdrop and lights for this that's crazy <laughs> anyways this was after that last trip to paul i was like all right part of me wanted to see if i could become ripped you know, I played D1 Lax and I was never ripped as some of these people ever. And I was like, can I get that ripped? I can't really, you know, I'm not as ripped as like the rippedest people. If you've seen them, they're just shredded. This was me like dieting hardcore for a month. I went from like chunky to this in a month, but I don't know if I could get more than this maybe. And uh, I wanted to become a cage dancer in a Latin cage dancer, preferably make my way to a German undernight underground nightclub in a cage and to, uh, and to write about it. Cause I feel like strippers got a bad rep and I wanted to see what it was like on the inside and if they really got a bad rep and just to do it as a project. So I did this, I died. I've learned the brown rice diet. I found out that those salad places are ripping you off and you can make that for $2 on your own. Um, with chicken i uh i did all the workouts i bought a ticket to spain i got an apartment there and i applied to jobs you know i had these photos and this was my thing i had a couple more um 
And uh, I think I even, I even, I shaved my whole body for it. I took, uh, I started doing the Channing Tatum, you know, videos, YouTube tutorials on some moves. There's some difficult moves. I'm going to be honest. I'm tempted to try one. There's a, there's a kick in, a kick up and switch. It's pretty cool. Honestly, I don't think I can still do it, but I don't think I could ever do it. Um, anyways, I got a job and, uh, she said it was house calls and she said, you have to get a, uh, a phallus ring. I'm going to, I'm changing the first word, but it was a, a cock ring for those of you who are listening. That's the actual proper name. And, um, I said, oh, yeah, of course. I had no idea what that was. I, absolutely. And, uh, I looked it up, you know, at this point, my parents were like concerned I was going to do full nudity. Um, I was too, I'm not going to lie. I didn't want to be a prostitute. That was what I didn't want to do. That wasn't, that wasn't this project, you know? Uh, so I got the job. I did not get the ring and I got another job before that job really started. And so it never came to fruition, but I do have an email exchange confirming uh, it and that the job will start in the summer, I guess. But who knows if it would have ever came about. Honestly, I was less confident looking like this because I look like a dweeb up top. Um, but I wasn't very confident in myself at all. And when I got a little chunkier, I was freaking much more confident, um, which is strange, you know. So are you glad this, are you glad that project didn't kind of come all the way to fruition? No, definitely not. I definitely have, I definitely kind of want to do it again. I kind of want to become a stripper. I mean, you know, that's definitely, that would be insane. That'd be insane. That'd be like such an experience. The, the amount of confidence it takes to get up on stage and dance for someone is just, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what it would take. Yeah, I mean, speaking of fear, that's a whole different realm of it. That's like a self-confidence fear. And I have a lot of, I think I sent you the photo that's not too, uh, too photoshopped because there was some acne and I was like, oh, do I make this change and that change? And, you know, I was self-conscious. I am, mean, everyone is. And uh, oh, yeah. I don't know. I thought that would be a good way to c- confront it. So there you go. That's, that's your side hustle for your Porter film by day stripper by night. <laughs> I wish, I wish I could use that side hustle right now. <laughs> did you, did you ever, so you said you wrote, you wrote about this. Did you ever Where? I mean, what did, did you publish anything? No, I was in this ideology that I would never publish anything, try to publish anything until it was there. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Like until it was, the peak ability, you know, I was obsessed with that perfection and that like, yeah. Once I release something, it needs to be the best ever. And, um, so I never tried to release anything. I wrote for so long, millions and millions of words. I have these books. Yeah. I wrote this book three times over one book, I think. But, yeah. I mean, I'm trying not to swear as much, but I'm actually now that the film is done. Um, I think maybe there'll be a change or two, but now that it's this stage, I'll, be going back to that and hopefully I can be more mature and figure out how those stories can like, you know, not just be about me, but yeah, maybe they will be. I don't know. Well, it's, it's going to be fascinating to, I mean, I mean, just to, to hear these stories, the, the process of you going through all these different being the expert of all these different facets of life and careers and adventures. Like it's fascinating to hear, hear you talk through it and, and how you, how you, what you made yourself do to get there is, is not the norm. And it's a fascinating story to hear. Yeah. It's weird. I, now that I think when you say it like that, I'm like, the heck's wrong with me? Why am I doing so many things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's move on to the Porter film now. Yeah. So speaking, speaking of your heavy, somewhat immersive journalism esque escapades, um, what brought around the Porter film and tell us a little bit more about what it's about, um, and what you did in it. Yeah, sure. 
I, uh, I explained most of it at the beginning. This was supposed to be the first proof of concept. Um, and I figured the concept would be, well, I just keep doing these things. It, it seems most likely to have a TV show, you know, like this Anthony Bourdain was going now and dirty jobs had already been, I wanted to do much better than I wanted to be. Not that they're bad. I, I just wanted to be different, I guess, and do something dramatic. Um, and I figured that was what I wanted. So I got these people together, went there, everything fell through that I planned. The company I was supposed to work with, the videographer was supposed to film me, and I had already spent all these people's money to get there. Um, and so I got really lucky meeting, meeting a guy named Babin Dulal who agreed to do it for not a lot of money and then finding a company and eventually set out. And so you have a camera there and you're getting proof of what you do you're going to go much more all in than you've ever been, you know, because, because it's not just a camera that you're holding. It's a camera that you're hiring to hold. And this guy is a professional. Um, I think at the time, I mean, he turned out to be unbelievably gifted at 22. I'm, I can't do anything like that. And I'm 20, whatever. Uh, and so I'm going all in, I'm going all in everything they do. I'm going to do, I'm going to, drink the same thing. I'm going to eat the same food. If they have one shirt, I have one shirt. If that shirt is cotton, I'm going to have cotton. Um, whatever they're going to do, whatever they're going to have. Am I going to buy new shoes? Eh, probably not because they probably wouldn't buy new shoes. So my shoes aren't going to have good treads. That was the level, I guess, of, of uh, assimilation I wanted to get. I wanted to experience their career, their, their job, not their job, just the job. It's not theirs. Um, to everyone's but the job as closely as I could to what the job required and then to try the most extreme version of that <laughs> so I went out and for 23 days did this project and um, over time there are little things that started to pop up and make you just question things you haven't seen before people drinking alcohol in the morning and at lunch while they're portering and this was a uh, you know, I play deal on the cross. People drink a lot. I've never seen someone drink while they're performing um, in summer sometimes, but never at, at this level and for money. And they say they drink because it's cold. I don't know how much is true. I don't know how much isn't true of that, but that kicked it off. And then the food, the food is, is sometimes they're eating, we're eating potatoes that you dig out of the dirt ground and bring straight to the table. I think you heat them up, maybe wash them. I'm not sure. And then you just peel off the skin and put salt on it and take a bite. And that's, that's your meal. That's your meal. It's just potatoes. That's it. And you keep going and, and things start, you start to see the hierarchy between porters and Everest porters. You know them as Sherpas but there's this whole hierarchy. We're sitting in a room eating dinner, half of the room. And this is at Kalapatar, which is the highest uh, town right before Everest. And uh, there's only one Porter house here. So there's about 25, 30 or 40 of us in this room. And uh, half the room is people who work on Everest. Half of the room is everyone who works in the industry below it, which is the bigger industry actually in terms of numerically. And uh, we're not interacting. The people on Everest, Art can drink whiskey, can drink, can eat a lot of food. The porters are starving themselves because you make $15 a day, 20 if you're lucky and 12 if you're not, and you pay for your housing food. And the high camp, things are expensive and you're paying more than you're earning sometimes. So you're literally in a deficit, you're losing money. So people aren't eating as much and, and they can't interact. And I'm realizing I'm, I'm not only working this job, I'm working a job that's very low on the totem pole. You know, to, to get to Everest as a worker, you need to have like $3,000 to get all the equipment. Like if you literally look, boots for Everest, like 600 plus bucks, you know, how do you get that money? You can't get it saving as a porter and probably not even from tips. You probably have to become a guide and learn like a ton of languages because they all speak a ton of languages. And then maybe you'll get lucky if you can get a sponsorship, if you can somehow get the money to go on Everest. And I'm getting thrown into this as me, this dumb idiot, you know, who does the stripper thing. And, uh, and then I'm in the back room and the, the government's cut the power because they're saving money. No one really knows why they cut it at 7 PM, but sometimes it's at five or three or 11 or who knows, you know, and it's negative 20 degrees and we're sleeping in beds. You know, there's 
two or three bunk beds um, in this back room and there's three people to a bed minimum, you know, and we're worried I can't get on top because we'll break it or something. That's, that's the worry. And uh, I sleep with these people on the bottom and I wake up and my blanket's gone, you know, and the two have, the other two other porters have taken it in their sleep, you know, as your brother does. And I, I couldn't pull it back. You know, I have all my clothes on to begin with, but, I'm not going to pull it back. I'm there visiting. I'm visiting, you know, I'm leaving in like one, the second we get down in every, when I do these projects in my mind, it's like a countdown to the end. I'm so violently wishing for the end. It's like, I want this to be over. I love doing that, but that's how my mind works. And um, so that all happens. And an experience like that is going to take a long time to set in. And uh, <laughs> two weeks later, I was on a plane to Hollywood. I wish I could show the picture. I was on a plane to Hollywood with a ticket. Here we go, to Hollywood, you know, I never thought this would be harder than Everest. And uh, that's crazy. I, I, and I was going there, I was going down that route, still pushing the, the idea for a series of basically all the stuff we've talked about, doing more, putting on the screen, you know, Formula One. I had a, a log line, a, uh, whatever it's called. I don't even remember the word, like a pitch deck. And uh, the log line was like Anthony Bourdain meets dirty jobs. And um, the, the adventures at the bottom were like NFL, Formula One driving, uh, you know, deep sea spear fishing, just crazy stuff like elephant um, tracking protector or uh, I can't even remember the word for what they're called the people who steal elephant tusks but yeah it was some crazy stuff and i was pushing this and i was on a bike with no brakes biking around la in these sweatshirts that were ratty because i had no money and i was sleeping on a friend's couch and all i had was this hard drive this this hard drive here i had no backup the other one i had sent to someone in australia i hadn't even backed it up online and i was just biking and having these meetings with ridiculously high profiled companies and in boardrooms with circular tables and oval tables and i'm sitting there as this schmuck still pushing this now at the same time i'm having all this success pushing it and like my mind is like devolving into that quarter life crisis or who knows what it is but i'm i'm plummeting like pretty hard and pretty fast and things are getting worse and my thoughts are getting harder to control and it's not doing i'm not doing well so i leave um, go home and coincidentally my dad had an editing system so I edited the other a trailer for Hollywood still and uh, thinking someone would come along and make the film you know make my film and uh, nope that was a pipe dream so for the next six to eight months I uh, I edited this film and for the first three I was still making the Hollywood thing and then I, I kind of started to realize you know what it was I had that I had proof of another job another career i had proof of another career that probably wouldn't be shown otherwise if i didn't show it maybe it would but this story wouldn't i had proof of kind of of a problem and i had all that proof as a foreigner right so like i i'm not an apology i'm not i have no real ties there and i had this proof and i felt this just wait just wait i know i was in that room for a long period of time by myself I couldn't I couldn't like take care of myself I wasn't really showering I was just so obsessed with, with figuring this out because this weight was so heavy um you know if I, am I gonna make them look bad like am I gonna make them look bad to the whole world what if they can't watch this film you know what what the hell I went there with a camera and recorded their job with a camera and just popped in and out like what what the hell was I doing you know and it was this crash course in empathy and it was a crash course in privilege. I didn't, I didn't think privilege existed at all period before I was, came from, you are what you make of yourself and that's it. And I got into this place and I just learned that that's, you know, there's a mindset to it, but there's a very real privilege is very real. And uh, people start off at different points and it was a, very sobering opportunity for me to learn. I think it's really relevant to what's going on now, but I'm definitely not, you know who I am. I just talked about it. You know, I'm not, 
I never thought I'd be in this position. Um, but I was, and so I made the film ultimately to just reflect, you know, my experience of it um, with as little of me as I could, because if you're going to make a film about another's job, you don't, they don't want to see you, you know, they want to see some random person trying it. So I cut out all these photos and videos about my background and, um, here we are now. I like to share this part because I think this is what's important is like people can, if I can pass this on to someone who's younger, then they can maybe get further than me um, more, you know, quickly. Uh, they can learn or they don't have to do something insane to, to get there. Uh, and if they want to, they probably can because if I did it, they can probably do it too. But I don't know that that's the general film and, and it just tells you about it's just basically like a chronological, you know, recollection of the event and uh, interspliced with some, some narrative facts from their perspective about what portering uh, entails. So that was, that, I mean, that's basically the film. Yeah. I realize I've been looking at your photos the whole time, which isn't directly on, but. <laughs> so, so, Nate, I, I got a question for you. Again, this is this is like fascinating. The evolution of like, uh, just just kind of the evolution of you through these 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 formative years of of who you who you went into this wanting to be to now where you are and how this film has like kind of kind of showcased that in a in a very powerful powerful way. And uh, we, we had we were fortunate enough to be able to watch your film um, and get to get to see it and, and kind of watch what you produce, which is is amazing. And it's a really, really amazing, fascinating experience. Uh, but like your, your, your inspiration has shifted. So you've gone from, I, I'm kind of as Zan, as Zan's like buzz terms for it were kind of this, this extreme experiential uh, Zan fill me in with the rest of the other, the other terms that you used. <laughs> oh, just, I mean, it's essentially immersive journalism Yeah, yeah. is what I, what I see it as. Yeah. And so you've gone on this, like, it's, it's about Nate. It's about Nate and it's about this doing something ridiculously hard. And, and now it's kind of shifted. Like you're now the inspiration and, and uh, push of this film is a little bit different, has a little bit more deeper and, and many more layers to it. Kind of circle back to that a little bit more and like kind of help us understand a little bit more of how you've changed in the inspiration of the making of the Porter film for you. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Zan, first of all, I mean, I'm glad you, yeah, you got it right on the head. The immersive journalism. I like that. But I, I think it was always my goal to show people that people in these places, whether it's a favela or wherever, aren't as dangerous or whatever. They're just people, you know, like people can be evil. They can be good. They can be bad. I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to rid the world of evil, I guess. But I mean, I, I don't know. I just want to show that we're all, we're all people. You know, it's about time. If we want to go to space, how can we be dealing with our own problems and races and stuff? Um, and I just wanted to show that, you know, here's this job and they're proudful. They're strong. That's what was my goal. This, obviously, I stepped, uh, I stepped pretty far, maybe too far, um, and realized a whole lot about everything and that I have a lot more to realize. And if I go forward, I don't know if I'll do another project. Um, Maybe it's what I have to do because I'm maybe I can't do anything else. But if I do, I'll just be more aware of it, of what I'm doing, you know, um, which will help a lot. But honestly, how has it shaped it? I mean, I was writing all this time and I never put out a book, you know, I made I captured one thing on tape and I made a film. I'm not saying I'm a filmmaker. I'm just saying this is the first time I had an impetus. I had a reason to finish it. All the other stuff, if I bailed, it was on me. You know, I quit. That's fine. I'll do it later. I'll pick it up. But this was like, I can't. The longer I wait, the longer this story goes untold. And, uh, and I also had people's money on it. And there were so many different factors that were like, I, ha I have to do this. If I don't do this, if I get well, you know, I get cocky, like I'm getting my name out there. Yeah, let's go. My career is getting off. And then when it does really bad and I want to give up, I'm like, you can't, you can't. 
you haven't gotten it far enough. I mean, it, not enough people know, you know, ultimately about this issue in the world or, or this not issue or these people, or I, I don't want to get political with it. That's not my job. My job is my story, but I finished this to share what I experienced because I feel it's dated. So, yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, you went in to starting the Porter film as you wanted to do this thing because you knew it was going to be crazy hard. Um, being at super high altitude, carrying hundred kilogram packs. Um, but then you're, looks like, seems like your pers perspective completely shifted after you actually kind of experienced what they're actually experiencing and kind of the, the political aspect of their situation. And yeah, now you can take that and um, implement it, I guess, into like your future projects and stuff. I've, Sounds, it sounds like it gave you kind of more of a direction. Yeah, I think. Because of that extra kind of cultural shock. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all, we're all kind of figuring it out. As I'm still caught up in this and I'm still touring it and I still feel like I have an obligation to it, it's hard for me to think of what's next or where I'll go. Um, that's the truth. I don't really know, you know, I'm, I, I'm gonna write go back to writing i'll write up some of the stuff about the film and the economics i think in my experience that it isn't in the film um that i'm not sharing here you know just about some of that the economics i think uh but i don't really know you i gotta i feel like i got a lot more work to do on this and you know sharing at least that i discovered privilege is i think a message that coming from a lax you know, player at UVA, which is a quintessential um, snobbiness. It's a reality. I mean, I literally didn't really think that existed before. And if I didn't, I'm not the only one. And it's not necessarily their fault. You know, we just don't know. So, I, I mean, yeah, who knows? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, is there, is there any one, one message for anyone that you want them to get from the Porter film? Um, I don't know. The message has changed so much, you know, to, to fight for the advocacy of these, this, this problem, not them or theirs or whatever, just our problem, you know, or not even problem, just this. Or is it just to expose people to what it looks like to travel, you know, to, to get in with another culture? What does it look like? Um, maybe that's my real gift is just, you know, sh sharing other cultures and learning how to connect with them. How do you connect with other people? I, you know, I think there are a lot of different issues. I think one is you can go as big as you want one of the takeaways, you can go as big as you want and you can do it, you know, <laughs> you can do it. I had like no money to do this and it's not, I had a lot of privilege, obviously staying with my parents and making it and getting them pay for my food and stuff. That's unbelievable privilege, but as Paul, I, I was possible for me. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible for you, but I do think people will help. People will help you if you have a mission and uh, if you're committed to showing that. And I don't really know. Any other messages? I mean, do you have any messages? I'm not. I mean, I, I, I think that's a pretty good message. I was going to kind of follow that up with um, uh, just what you said right there at the end um, for kind of getting people help along the way to travel or, you know, experience something that you did um, or just get a better under understanding of uh, various cultures or something. How can people get a hold of you? if they want some more guidance in that aspect. Yeah. I'm, um, I mean, get <laughs> for me for guidance. <laughs> um, hey, you've made the mistakes. I, I have made a, so. a mistakes. And I'll make a lot, <laughs> but I mean, you can call me, you can email me. I don't mind. Um, I think you have to be like stage a famous to like not put your phone number and stuff out there and stuff. But Otherwise, I mean, I'm happy to hear from anyone. 
so many people have helped me and heard me out and have listened to me rant about something that would never happen or things like that, um, that at this point I kind of have to pass it on. You know, I kind of have to lawyers talking to me for free, like things like this. I got it. I got to pass it on. So, you know, I mean, I, like you guys are helping me. I want to help you, you know, if, if there's a, a place that I can help that I can come on that I can talk to even just the people talking to me. I mean, I'm sure by the hundredth, it might get hard, but everything gets hard. I can't really complain. I'm talking, I'm talking about my life. That's like, can't really complain about that. So, but you can reach out to anyone can reach out to me, email me. I mean, we can post it afterwards. I can say it if you want, but my phone and email, they can put it. Under yeah. The- we, we had your email at the start and it'll go in a post show email as well. Um, and then you just created the Instagram and then you have the Porter film Instagram as well. Yeah. So there's, there's your email for anyone watching and Menninger one at gmail there it is. I didn't notice it. yeah check yeah. your spam nate check your spam no i know got <laughs> all too good. i got some spam i got some good emails from marshall that went into spam and then i was uh i was trigger trigger happy to respond and uh i'm happy i could come on here and and just try and mend some of the the undergoings of the last week, but it's nice to be on. It is nice to be on. It's, it's nice. It's a nice little prez you guys got. Hey, I, I got one one last question for you, and I, I think you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but it's it's super fascinating to me because uh, you, you don't think like most of us. Uh, we all think it individually and, and very independently, but you, you, you think it to a, a very fascinating different beat that is just adventure to the max. What kind of two parts to this? What will determine if the if this film is it's made it it's made it for you? What 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 point would that be for you? It's a good question. Um, I don't know if it will ever be there. <laughs> um, I think being there will be once it reaches the dead end or something. Uh, part of me want you know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just gonna keep pushing it. I'm going to keep pushing it and then pushing my own story after it, you know, like a, like a train. Cause I do think my story uh, might even be able to pack, you know, a similar amount of people as a film. So I don't know if I'll make it. I'm just going to keep going because I honestly have nothing else going for me. Like if you do all this stupid stuff I've done, you like, that's your life. Like I have pigeonholed myself into it's either this or nothing else. Um, and I could go back to school, but I hate school. And it's uh, too formal for you. Too formal yeah, for you. You, yeah. you learn out there in the field. <laughs> I'm not too good in school. I, I, uh, I don't know where the film will go. I think we'll just, keep, we'll keep going. I think touring will be nice. I'll, I'll have a much better grasp on it after, uh, a tour through universities that we're doing and the opportunity to connect and talk more about the academic facets of it and things like that. Uh, but yeah, I do think differently. I, 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 in this, after this particular, I'd like to run away from my privilege. I always have. So I don't yeah. know. I think back. It'll be that German stripper. <laughs> yeah, that would be the cage. Dope. What was that? <laughs> There's a couple of things I was thinking about, but. Becoming homeless. I mean, I don't know. might have tried to become homeless the other night, but then last, I don't know. There's, there's a ton of things that I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm reining it in, but yeah, it's a different life. It's a different life. Well, keep us posted. Keep us posted how the evolution of, of Nate as a, as a journalist, a filmmaker, uh, uh, this immersive journalism that you're, you're digging into. It's, it's fascinating to follow the journey and, um, this is a this is a, a very neat story and experience that uh, hopefully uh, your tour continues in a positive light and and there isn't necessarily a, a dead end in a negative light. It's a positive light for you. Yeah, exactly. I think less about me though going forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you can you can do a a lot of good with your immersive immersive journalism and writing about um, kind of the cultural perspectives that you have put yourself in. Yeah, ultimately, that's the. The goal so that those five years don't go to waste. 
Yeah. But yeah, cool. Right on. Well, well, thanks so much, Nate, for coming on the show. It was great talking with you and hearing some of your outlandish stories and <laughs> triumphs and uh, mishaps. That's the end of this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below so you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our audience, so if you have feedback, would like to discuss these topics further, or if you or someone you know would be a good future guest, please let us know. Until next time, remember, adventure is better together.